Hello, audience. Welcome back to our live stream sessions. This time I'm having a guest from Denmark here, Andreas. Hi, very Hello. nice to meet you. Hi. I already asked you this question, but I want to ask it again publicly. How do I spell your last name? It's called Owen, so like a double A. Okay. For in Denmark, it's uh, Andreas Owen. Yeah. That's cool. It's, uh, some like Germans might spell it differently, and also English speaking might spell it. English speaking yeah. people might spell it differently. So um, it's good to know that. They normally call me Ian. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I want to show the disclaimer before we go uh, into details um, that we are safe here on the legal side. Uh, the main message of the disclaimer is that you have to do your own research and do your own work. What we are doing here, even if we are mentioning certain stocks or securities, is just a qualified talk. It isn't a recommendation. So please do your own work. You will find a disclaimer if you want to read it below. It's linked, so you can read it. It's also on the website, goodinvesting.net. Um, but without further ado, I'm happy to get into our conversation and I'm happy to invite our audience as well to ask questions during our live stream. Um, so if you have questions, please type them in in the chat and I will have a look and uh, try to integrate them in our talk. Maybe let's start with Denmark. Um, what is interesting to know about the Danish stock market and what are other interesting companies besides the well-known name Novo Nordisk? Yeah, I think one of the main things with the Danish stock market is like it's it's normally like a little bit of a safe haven for some investors because it's uh, there's a lot of like medtech companies, medical companies, and and stuff like that that is like producing really really stable returns there. So if you look back the last like one, three, five, ten years, it has actually been one of the the main exchange that has performed the best in in the whole world there. So. But but that is also the cost because the the safety and the the good corporate guidance there is uh, in some of those uh, cases. Um, I would say on on the other side is that the, the Danish stock exchange is mostly large companies there. Um, the small cap space in Denmark is quite uh, less sophisticated and developed there. Um, there there's not the same culture in Denmark for you know investing in small caps like there is like in Sweden or Norway or some of the companies we compare us to. How many small caps, small cap companies are in Denmark and how big is the universe? Um, I'm not sure, but I would think a few hundred of them, at least what I will yeah, call real small caps. Then there are some small property companies, football clubs and stuff like that, but a, a few hundred of what I would call like normal stuff, small caps I could, I could invest in. Um, and they're really different size and uh, different um, sectors and stuff like that. We have a few like banks also and stuff like that. Yeah. From the companies I know, you're talking about your more global investor, or also, do you have also? Would would you say you have a regional focus? Um, I would. I you know, as most investors, you know, I started looking at my home market when I was you know a young investor when I started up. So. Uh, you know, basically, when I launched the fund, we were maybe 50% Danish or something, and I think today it's 0% uh, in Denmark. Um, but we do, we have mostly been in Scandinavia, you know, throughout the, the, the fund, and I think still today it's between 40 and 50% is in Scandinavia. And then, but we also, we do really hold the Europe and, uh, and also US. So uh, I, I would say that it develops over time our comfort zone where, where to go. Um, how did you find your way into investing? Um, actually, I, I did like read books when I was younger and stuff like that. But I I tried out, you know, back when I was like 14, 16 and something. But I tried different things. They're also doing like technical analysis and chart patterns. And I really like, I was into a different kind of options there. And I, I could remember like, when I was, you know, younger, before I could trade myself, I was like speaking to my father a little bit about my, uh, you know, it's not like a trust fund like you have in US, but like some some savings they put aside for children in Denmark, a small amount. 
pounds. But um, and then like what to do with them and. But it was only like when I was started as a trainee in a, a big accounting firm that it I really like. I would say like hit it there. Uh, you know, I, I got the connection between what I learned from accounting to investing and. I learned that okay, I could actually use you know um, read the financial statements and stuff like that, and use that to make money in the stock market. So I was saying then that way I got introduced to yeah Warren Buffett and uh, and stuff like that, and and basically yeah develop myself from from there on. How would you describe your investment style currently, and how did it change over the years? I think there also is some natural development there, like. Most when I started up, I was probably what people would call like a deep value guy. Um, it was a lot of quantitative stuff where I was like price to books and price to earnings and free cash flow yields and 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 stuff like that that I I really looked at. Um, in in Denmark, there was a lot of those really small um, like cheap stocks that, on those metrics after the financial crisis that has not gotten up a lot. Um, so we made a lot of money on, on some of those smaller like, names, but I would say like over time I've been more into like looking at you know stronger business model the psychology and investing you know management teams and and stuff like that but you know it, it takes much more time to learn how to evaluate a management team than it does to how to read a financial statement so so that's something you need to be like comfortable with and it has taken time and it's something I, I still keep uh, really try to develop uh, still Were there certain insights that made you shift your style to more a qualitative approach? Um, there, you know, there is you know, sometimes when you hit like you know, when you find like a cheap stock at like six times earnings that it go to ten times earnings, you made like fifty percent return there. But I was, you know, I was hitting like some companies that also also grew a lot, and I made like ten x returns on, on some of those stocks there. Um, I, I was maybe lucky to get into some of those because they were both cheap and growing a lot. So, so I got both effects there. But uh, th then I could really see, okay, the way you know I make a lot of money is not to do like like multiple arbitrage, but more to to really find like, like what I call time arbitrage in, in good compounding stocks. Um, but then it was also more like what I read and what other you know investors I I looked into and stuff. Like that. So, so in the beginning I. I looked a lot at you know Warren Buffett and Benjamin Graham, and then more you know the more I grew, I get into like Joe Greenberg, Charlie Munger, and stuff like that. So I think there was like a natural development there in in the approach I, I took. I already saw that there are some questions coming in. Um, I will work them in during our yeah, yeah, talk, perfect. and um, thank you already for the questions to my audience and um, if you like the content till now you can also leave a like but back to our conversation you said that evaluating management teams is is something that isn't that easy um how you're going forward with this and what how your way of evaluating management team changed during the years i think there's there's two aspects of it the the first one is just learning by you know mistakes like and You know, I, I did plenty of mistakes. You know, early on, early on with the fund, there. Um, you know, e even through the returns, has quite consistently been good. There was a lot of mistakes uh, that I learned from. Uh, what, I would say what, one one good example is like there was um, a UK-based company called Globo. It was a Greece origin uh, that turned out to be a, like a total fraud. Um, where you know, I, I actually went to London like to visit the management team and like, I was asking them questions and you know the CFO just looked into my eyes and, and like totally straight answered all my questions um, and then like three weeks later you know they put out a release that it was a fraud and the stock was worth zero uh, so th now, then I got back like, okay look at what was the, the the red flags I should have looked at and and stuff like that so I think some some of that is just like um like yeah experience building up what to look at and what to ask and stuff like that um and i would say the other, the other important thing about evaluating management teams is like normally when i i met or talked to management teams I, i always came back like wow those guys are really good there it, it was really seldom i came back to and thought, okay th those are really really bad management teams so so then i i i just learned that you know for for me to you know the management teams i think that is good is probably average 
it's only the ones that I think is really, really, really good that is probably good there. So, so I just yeah heightened the bar for for what I think I should because you know you only become CEO if you're good at sales also. So, so even average managers are are quite good at talking to investors. It's an interesting point. I already heard this from an other investor that I would call a very good investor. So it's uh, <laughs> I like the comparison. <laughs> yeah, that's uh, a thing to take away. I think uh, yeah. management they really have to impress you to be very good and high quality. If you investors often compare themselves to other investors, um, how would you describe your style in comparison to others, or what do you do different? I will say, you know, in, in the beginning, as I said, I, I try to like do a little what Warren Buffett did, did. But one of the investors I was really into in his young days was uh, David Einhorn, the way he managed like a long short fund as I do. And I think a lot of what he did when he was, you know, a, a much smaller uh, investor and the early returns he had, there's, I think there's a lot of comp comparisons to what I do today. Uh, so that's definitely one guy that, that I was really impressed with. Uh, of course, he had made a, like a lot of mistakes the last few years, um, and I think one thing I tried to do differently was he. It seems like he got a little stubborn into this, you know, long value, short growth thing, and got burned a bit. Where I tried to be a little more, yeah, adaptable in the market situations we have there. But I would say the way he structured it and is definitely someone I, I respect a lot there. So you're shorting as well. Yeah, yeah, we do as well. Uh, not to the same same extent that we are wrong, but we 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 do short uh, and have, I would say, quite good success over time. It is hard to do, especially like in a market like we have had the last few years. But um, it's it's something I do it to create alpha in the portfolio, and it's been quite good. But I also say it just makes me a much better long investor. Like you know, when, when you're short, you need to be right on your research. You you learn to cap your risk and you know do stop losses and like close positions when it doesn't work for you and you know you look for all the bad signals because like you know when you're short you can lose indefinitely so you need, you need to be really really tight on on your risk control there so i definitely think that makes you a bit on the long side also what is your way to generate ideas for long and short positions so um, Long positions, it's it's really like something I could call compound, you know, pound the rock invest. <laughs> like I just like turns a lot of rocks, and there's not one source I would say that where I get all the ideas. It's like um, I have a big network of other investors I talk to. I in the early days I did a lot of like screens and stuff like that, but I mostly not do that anymore. And um, I look at like Twitter and I talk to all investors. I like. Also, sometimes, like when, when I research one company, I, I ask them, they're like, who's your greatest competitor? And if three of them mention the same company, that's probably a company I should uh, look more into. Um, so there's not some source I would say that I get most of their ideas. It's it's really just have your eyes open and and be really good at like cutting off the noise and try to build, you know, a watch list of the, of the greatest companies I can find. How much did you travel to research companies and how much do you take uh, talking to management into account? Um, I would say the companies I'm, I'm able to travel to, I have tried to do so like in Scandinavia or like London or uh, even some in Germany. Like I have tried to travel there, meet them in person. Um, and of course, it's more easy when I can... Um, like in London, I can set up like eight management meetings over three days or something, and because everyone is close there, uh, and also I could do that in Stockholm and Copenhagen uh, and, and so forth. While you know, while when I'm like researching U.S. companies or stuff like that, it's mostly yeah Zoom calls and something with management teams there. Uh, but I I can I probably can't think of a stock that I haven't talked to the management or maybe some of the bigger ones. It's not CEOs but IR guys. Uh, uh, but normally I, I would have like at least a Zoom call or something with them. And no, normally I also follow companies like a minimum six, 12 months before I buy them. So I try I try to look for good companies, even when they are like overvalued and do some research on them, put them on the watch list, then just keep following them. And, and then at some point I get comfortable owning them. Yeah, that's a good way to handle that. Yeah. How does 
the way you research companies in the six to 12 months where you're following them look? Um, I would say, of course, now because of COVID, the, I, I just recently started traveling again to like Stockholm and that has been, yeah, Norway has been the only in Scandinavia, but um, the next like six to 12 months, normally I try to do quite like intensive research when I learn about a new company, um, like maybe spend like two, three whole days on it. Uh, but then normally I will put it off a little bit because what I learned is what normally happens is when I look at something, I get really excited about it and like, oh, this is so good company and I don't really care about the multiples. I just want to own it. Uh, but then like when I, I, I when I just take like like one week cooling off and take it back again, I was like, okay, maybe it was not that good. Maybe I, I got a little excited there when I was doing all the work and I wanted to like justify the hard work I, I did there. So, so normally it's good to do like tight research and then just follow it a little from the sideline, like just sporadically for, for a few months there, talking to management maybe one time after the earnings call. And, and then, and then you know, when it becomes cheap or uh, there is some time of event that makes me want to invest, I speed the process up again a little bit. There's one question from the chat coming that seems to be urgent. I will ask it in a second. But before that, I also want to invite, invite others to ask questions. Yep. They are very welcome. The question is, um, what's your views on FII and DII manipulation? Oh, FII and DII. I hope uh, it's FII or it's F FLL or F11. I don't really understand that question, sorry. <laughs> I, I either, maybe um, the person who asked can um, write out what these uh, short name stand for um we also um want to we also want to take a look at um free ideas you currently find interesting maybe um let's start with the most popular idea um even for like four guys that hang out on twitter and are interested in testing <laughs> it's it's Kambi and it's somehow yeah. linked to Basto sports what is the link there yeah, so what can be is, is they are the premium B2B sports provider. So they basically, like, it's the technology supplier there. They do um, all the API integrations to, to, you know, an operator, do the trading, the odds compiling, you know, every, everything that's really the backbone of driving, like, a, a really good sports book. Um, so what, like, Barstool does or DraftKings or some of, you know, the big US guys that, but also like in Europe, like Unibet and Leo Vegas and some of the guys we know here. Um, what they do is like they, they build the front end themselves or Cambi can also help them do it. And then they integrate all the odds feeds and um, and the, uh, you know, the lines there from Cambi and Cambi trades them for, for them. Uh, so they do all the customer acquisition and customer support and um, and Cambi just really collects like a ref share on, on their part. Um, so, so that's I think it's like a really good business model here because they have extremely network effects. They 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 only have to trade the, for example, like the Tour de France. They only have to trade the odds once. But if they have like eight or twelve operators, they do they only need to do it one time. Um, so they can really just invest all their money in building the best product, and then the more and more operators that connect to them, they they just collect the revenue share on it. So while like DraftKings or Barstool are growing, can be growth with them. That's interesting. Um, maybe I, I want to show some charts on this company yep. as well that we can get a certain idea. Um, it's from the very interesting tool Ticker. If you want to try it out, I will link it below. Um, I think it's a very interesting tool for fundamental investors. There we go. Um, maybe you can, if, if you want to add something on the, the revenue and profitability development in the last years, um, yeah, company and maybe certain stages and wh why you came interested in this company. Yeah, you could see like it, it was already like a really good business over the past few years. Like I think they compounded the revenue at around like 25, 28 percent CACRA there, you know, all the first five years after they spun out of uh, of Unibet. There was a spin off from Unibet there or what is called like Kindred Group now. Um, but I think what's really interesting is the US story now. Uh, they are like they have been, you know, taking the first bet in the, I think it's something like out eleven out of twelve states or something in the U.S. Um, and they they are 
I just first move in all the states there they have like between really between like 80 and 30 percent market share in each state there uh between like uh, uh you know all the operators really like in pennsylvania the power i think it's something like six out of nine operators something now uh, so they, they have huge market share in uh, in the u.s uh, because it's there are so there's so strict regulatory requirements in the u.s compared to at, in europe uh, so o- operators they're really really want to partner with the best uh, the best teams uh, so they have a good advantage there and what we see now is just state by state by state regulation so right more and more states open up you know the the revenue will just expand and it, it's really grown like exponentially now like that that 28 percent revenue growth that will just explode here i think there is there will be some setbacks from time to time but i think it's it's a really good setup and one thing I, I would add, uh, one thing, the last thing I think I should add there is that the what we will see and what I don't think the market still realizes is the margin potential there. Like, um, like we we have seen with our company last, like GAN that went from like ten percent to fifty percent, and we saw the evolution that went from twenty to sixty an hour or something. So, so that margin expansion happens extremely quick in companies like this. Is it founder led? Uh, yeah, it's uh, still found a lot. Yeah, like um, as you know, the the way the background of it is that it um, it was doing it was really the internal sports book for Unibet that's owned by Kindred Group. Um, but then at some point, the um, the founder of uh, Unibet called uh, Anna Strom and the uh, the director of uh, what's called Campy now, uh, Christian Nyland, they sat down to think, okay, how can we use this knowledge to get external uh, operators to to come into this network and build like more scale to develop an even better product. Uh, so they decided to spin this company out of uh, Kindred Group. Um, and today, Anna Strom uh, still owns around 20% of it sit on the board. Uh, and Christian Nyland uh, is still the CEO today and have, I think, 3 4% of the shares also. Uh, so that, and all the other like executive, uh, the COO, the CTO and CFO has been here for between three and 10 years. So it's definitely still led by the people that started it. There's one question coming I want to add to our conversation. Mm-hmm. What kind of potential is there for Kambi in South America in terms of size versus the US? Um, it's, I would say both markets are still hard to quantify right now, but one thing that is quite important, if you look at South America, is there, there is some of the same characteristics like in the US. Uh, where you know they they give land-based casinos what they call skins like some they can partner with only a few people and that so there's a limitation to how many brands that can come online um, and the first market that introduced like regulation there was like Mexico but then Colombia came in and so far I like, can be saying they have taken like 60 70 percent of the market uh, in Colombia through through the partnership with the um, corridor that has the brand called the Bitplay and through um, Rusty International has a brand called Rustbet. Uh, in the Colombian market, so that's that's one example of how how huge markets are they they take there, and they think they can do the same thing, you know, in Brazil and Argentina and some of the bigger markets that will will regulate now in Latam. So, to help me understand better yeah. what they are doing, because I have no clue. About yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, they are some kind of the software for all this betting yeah it's 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 it is the software but it's really like people driven like so basically when you go to uh, like in in germany like you download like a unibet app and you want to like play with manchester through um, you know uh, liverpool against and then you see like oh that's like a 1.8 if you bet on manchester like 2.2 if you bet on liverpool and maybe a three on the x um, but unibet don't decide that that's that's uh, can be that's uh, make those lines um, but then it was, you know, if some players are trading a lot on Manchester United, they know, you know, should we change the line? Should we cut the people off? Maybe he has some insider knowledge. And so they both do set the lines, they move the lines and then do the, the trading uh, in, on the back end on it. Uh, and this is something that, that requires both algorithms. Um, it calls like manual traders that know, you know, because like if you have like a second level football match in Denmark, it's good to have a good algorithm, but you need to know some of, you know, if the best player are sick at, at the match, like it, it tips the point a lot there. So, so you need the, some knowledge there and some traders that can do that. And and Kambi is, you know, by far the leader in that. So, the operators 
uh, the brands that all that can be is not well known because you know consumers don't see the can be brand. Uh, they see the DraftKings, the Unibet, etc. Um, so, but but I think can be is a more valuable part because that's really the, the engine that runs uh, uh, through this. So their moat is also legally protected because if they apply to the legal standpoints, it's the, it's hard uh, to there's get not, in. Um, it's more well, like I would call the scale and experience advantage. So they, they have spent like 20 years to build the technology around it. Uh, and then they build the knowledge and all the people around it. So they have thousand people now. Um, and it's really, really hard to get in there because you need the revenue to invest in the people. But you cannot get the revenue before you have the people to do that. So there is like, like a little uh, the chicken and the eggs thing there. So like if, if I wanted to start a, to compete with Kambi tomorrow, like I, I needed one guy that knows the Tour de France, one that knows basketball, one that, you know, uh, they have 300, 400 odd compilers there. Um, and then I need all the revenue and the technology around it. So it's, it's extremely hard to come in and compete with them there. It's interesting. There's another question in the chat. Um, what sizable sport, sports book operators could they win in the coming years? Is the pipeline strong enough to offset losing DKNG888 EBITDA in 2022? Yeah, so what we have seen so far is at least that, you know, they do keep signing new operators like they signed uh, some big ones in the Churchill Downs recently, the Bet America brand that migrated from one of their competitors called um, SB Tech. Um, then a big potential for them is also to sign the, the tribes in the in the US. They already signed three tribes there, but in, in some states like California or Florida, there could be actually the tribes that would get like a monopoly there. So for um, for Kambi to have a good spot with the tribes is really important. Um, and then we still have to see how it turns out with Data Data and DraftKings. They're like it's there is not a lot of precedence for a big one migrating off a platform. So we will have to see how that uh, how that turns out. Um, and I was still say like Bastu is still like a new brand even through the sign them. It's more than a year ago. Uh, like it's, it's still like some size of new brand because they, they just recently launched them and will now expand all through the for the US. Maybe as a last question on Kambi, where do you see the company in five years? I think um, I think the it's really wide outcomes, but I uh, you know it's still you know, it's actually still our largest position. So you know we, we think it's. Uh, Every outcome is really good there. It's just a matter of how good they will be. But, you know, some estimates we see like about the US market is that in like three, four years, it would be between 15 and $30 billion in uh, in revenue there. Um, so if, if, if Kambi can just take a 3% of, oh, sorry, like 10% of that market, and, and just to summarize, they have like four, between 40 and 60 now. So even if the market share declines to 10% and they keep like a 10% um, uh, revenue share on it, uh, then they will get like US revenue of around 300, 400 million there, and the current revenue run rate is around 130. <laughs> so, so it, they could they could like triple or quadruple their revenue just in a, a three, four years still. So, I think there's huge potential, and the margin will expand from 15, 20 to plus 40, I think. That uh, sounds very interesting, and there are some arguments where you make this the largest position. <laughs> yeah, for sure. <laughs> Um, we also have Naked Wines and where food comes from on the list. Yep. As there are already some questions on Naked Wines, I want to start with that. Yep. Um, how are you thinking about the potential subscriber base Naked can get in five to 10 years? I think, um, I think like there was already, I think what most people miss here is that they, they think it's just like a COVID beneficiary and you know, that will like turn away again. Was what most people don't understand is they were already growing quite nice before COVID. They were growing between 15 and 25% a year for like six, eight years before COVID. So it was not a bad business before COVID. They were growing like really high rates there. Uh, but now after COVID, they're growing the subscriber base at like 100% year over year, really. Um, so now it's just a matter of where will that kind of growth threaten us again. Uh, but for me, I think they can grow the subscriber base still at like between 
to be honest, I think that it could be between 30 and 50 percent a year the next few years before it maybe turns to more normal levels. Um, and I, I think there's just a huge potential for them to kind of build a higher retention and like more engagement on the platform and, and stuff like that that will give there, there's real network effects here. Like, you know, the angels want to be where, you know, there is most winemakers and the winemakers want to come to the platform where there is uh, like more bias there. Maybe you should take a step back and uh, I would like to invite you to yeah. maybe define what Naked Wines is doing and what their advantage against other yeah. players so, in the space is. Yeah, so I think the, the biggest thing to understand with Naked Wines is it's not like an online shop to buy wine. That, that's what most people are missing there. Like, And it's not like a subscription club where you just like pay some money every month and get like a, a predefined cage of wine. Those subscription businesses as online wine shops, there are like thousands of them. There is like huge competitive. What Naked Wines does is they, they're basically like a crowdfunding platform for independent winemakers. So they have what they call angels that every month they deposit between 20 pounds in the UK or $40 in the US into what they call a piggy bank. So it's not a subscription where they lose the money. It's just like a deposit they put into like a bank account in their own name. Uh, and Naked Wines use those money to crowdfund independent winemakers. So they could basically like call a guy that makes some really good wines at a famous you know winemaker and ask like, do you want to like have your own wine at some day? And we can like help you with marketing and the bottling and stuff. And we also have the customers that want the wine. So they convince people to get out of their own and start producing real exclusive wine there. And there's real, really benefits here because like, if you want to produce wine and you're good at that, what don't you want to do? You don't want to spend time selling it. You don't want to spend time on marketing. You don't want to spend time on like labeling, corking, bottling, or logistics, all that stuff. So Naked has that model that where, where they will have the customers in the angels that crowdfund you. And then they have, um, you know, all, all the logistics around it so that the winemakers should only concentrate in one thing that is producing the best possible wine there. And then, then I think the real thing is like they are really creating like you know engagement, like a community about the wine lovers here. So the the people that go onto the naked side to buy wine, they they don't go to, they don't get in on like a comparison side. Spend like two minutes and then choose what what's the cheapest wine. They spend like hours on the side, like reviewing wine, doing virtual tastings corresponding with the winemakers, getting feedback. And so, so there is like, like a real like connection here and a community they're building around it. I've, I want to switch the topic yeah. for a second because there's okay. someone urgently trying to uh, ask the question again we, haven't, we couldn't answer. It's how you detect uh, insider trading and take advantage of that. Ah, so... I would say it was something I was a little more focused on in the past. Like when you say insider things, like yeah, com company insiders, you know, buying or selling a stock. That's that's how I interpret uh, interpret it. Hate the question. Um, so of course, like if I'm into a company and the CEO is like dumping all his shares in the market, I, I pay attention to it. And vice versa, like in the last few months, like Naked Wines, both the CFO and the CEO has like bought more shares with their like the stock is has doubled from the low here and then they buy even more shares with their own te already tax money so of course i see that as post to signal and you know vice versa if like if campy's uh, ceo tomorrow would dump all his shares i would be quite nervous i would say so so i look into it but it's not like uh i would call it as i would not call it a big factor it's uh something that influenced me yeah then let's go back to naked wines um you mentioned the customers yeah. how happy are they I think the best way to measure it is like, as I say, like the the truth is in like the potting there. The, you, you can look at the retention rates they have. Like it's 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 really, really good retention rate for a consumer company that's like trading online. Um, and the best thing to compare them to is, you know, food box companies or like clothing companies or something that you can like build cohorts online. Um, and, you know, they have constantly have like above 80% retention on their customers. And even if you look at some of the more mature cohorts, uh, 
they are trending more to like plus 90% yearly retention there. So like if you buy a customer and they keep like 90% keep coming back year after year after year, that's basically like uh, because they, they love the community then they love what they get uh, through it. So I think that that's the best way to look at it. And like, you know, they, they, they rate the wine, they spend time on the side and stuff like that. So I think that's the best way to look at it. I want to take another question from the chat. Um, why would you, why would it not be obvious that the best place for consumers to buy wine would be at Costco under the Kirkland uh, house brand label? I think one one of the things that you know, I also get the same question a little bit related to Amazon and now it's to Costco and the the thing is in in the US uh, just to take that example is there is this three tier distribution system that for for most uh, most states the US um like retailers in the US and Amazon is a retailer because they own Whole Foods there. So they have to buy their wine through their um, through the distribution system. So that's through through independent distributors. So that's like a different line there that comes in there. So Amazon can sell it through the marketplace uh, around it, but but that's another question. Um, so I think what what differs with naked wines is that they they fund independent winemakers. So it's exclusive wine that you know you can only buy it through naked. Um, and I think what like Costco and what Amazon, what they will come in and compete with over time, it is more like the um, w the comparison sites, the generic you know online wine shops where they sell all the same wine as everyone else. And I, I think Amazon and to some extent Costco could take over that market. But I think there is really really a room for like a niche player like Naked that can like really attract the really strong wine love as they want to like learn about new exclusive wine that they cannot buy on Amazon. Yeah. That's interesting. I want to combine two questions from the chat. Um, yeah. One is directly on uh, Naked Wines. Uh, what are your thoughts on the new CEO, Nick Devlin? And another one is also related to this. Yeah. What are some of the questions you ask management to determine how good they are? And maybe what question did you ask to the new CEO to determine how good he is? Um, yes. Yeah. So so Nick is uh, Nick is based in uh, California. So I actually never met him in person, but I have had several yeah phone calls and uh, and you know Skype calls with him. Um, so I think you know the talks I have with Nick is mostly I think I think he understands the long term play here. So he he really understands what drive. You know, LTV, the, the, um, the lifetime value of the customer, and how they can buy them, and how to generate more and more networks effect into the platform. So he, he understands that his job is not to please, you know, the EBIT numbers next quarter or something. He understands how to build like something that is really, really valuable over time here. Um, and I think even even if through he's a new CEO, he was CEO COO before, and even before that he was in charge of the US business. So so he he got in the US business when there was in little trouble, I think it was four or five years back. And then he quickly turned around the US business and make that the profit driver, the growth driver for the business. Then he became COO for the whole business and now CEO. So he has a really, really long track record inside the business, even through his a little new as in the CEO position. Uh, but I would say one of the things about Naked is that they have a strong culture there and they have a really good model, so they don't need to change the model that much. Uh, so it's better to hire a guy that knows it from scratch and, and can keep improving it. And uh, what are the questions you use to determine if management is good? So, of course, one thing is not something you ask. Some, one thing is what you track them. You know, do, do, do they do what they say they do? Like if they say something on a conference call and the next conference call they say something else and... You know, the, the, you 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 track the track record, but on, both on the financial side, but also just on what they are saying. Um, but then I, sometimes I try to learn about you know management team a little bit, also like where do they live, what's their interest outside business, just to understand like what type of people they are. Um, and that's that's something uh, I look into. And then it's more like just to judge like how how much do they understand the business. Are they more focused on selling me the stock or are they just like, I really try to look at the passion they have for their business. So like, 
the the times I have talked with Nick, that he, he is like he, he just loved wine and you know finding new smart winemakers and you know he loved when he can see like hit the angels they crowdfund a new winemaker and have some interactions on the side and and it it seems like he just enjoyed building the community around it. So I think I, I really like CEOs that like burns more for the product and the customer than just for you know the financial side but of course they need to understand how they also create value for shareholders but to, to my extent you only create value for shareholders all the long term if you create value for the customers so so to see how they kind of to see how they know the customer proposition is really important interesting i want to go back to naked wines because i think we've got still one question open um If the market for wine subscribers proves to be smaller than expected, do you think Naked could focus more on single transactions in addition to the core subscription offering? Um, I think they really like the subscription offering uh, and not so much the transaction side, like if someone just buy with a voucher, like a coupon or stuff like that. Um, and there's two reasons for it. One one thing is like when people automatically put money into this piggy bank, they have a tendency not to pull it out again. So even through, they don't use the money. So I, I have seen examples of people that just like for a year without buying any wine, they just put 20 pounds into this piggy bank. And then suddenly remember, oh, I, I have this 240 pounds in my bank. Should I take them out? No, they go in and buy wine for all 240. So there is just like an repeat retention in that element. Um, and the other thing is like, that's something that really separates um, you know, naked wines from, you know, even if Amazon wants to compete with them over time, um, th th they have this negative working capital where they can use this um, funding from angels to fund the winemakers. Like if you look at Amazon's model, it's all about like extending payables to their suppliers, but here the suppliers need money up front. So it's, it's a huge difference to the way that, you know, Amazon won't go in there and do it the other way there. Um, so I think that's quite important for them to have this model. With the next question, we're doing something dangerous. We're mixing beer and wine. But uh, the question is if Naked uh, could be successful in spirits or craft beer as well. Uh, I will not rule it out, but I think they are so much into wine and the, the potential market in wine is so insanely big that I think they should just keep focus on what they're good at. Uh, but I... It's not something management had mentioned for me, and so I could not rule it out it will happen at some point. But I think at least for now, like if you have a really good business growing at you know 80 percent the last quarter, or at least look, even if it's 20 or 30, you should just keep your your head straight and do what you're good at. Maybe to sum it up here and move on to food, but um, to sum it up, I have the question: How big is the wine market? So the wine market is insanely big, but um, But in the US, you know, uh, and also in Europe, still like most of the wine is still bought in supermarkets. So like people still go to supermarket, buy like a five dollar wine or something. Um, and that wine is just like the, the thing is that there's really no wine in that wine, like because the bottles is there, the taxes is there, the corks and label and distribution and logistics and all that stuff is in that bottle. So when you go in Germany and pay like, like a five euro wine, there's probably like less than one euro of wine in it. Uh, and so what Naked can do is like cut all the middlemen and actually create, you know, good wine there. Um, so uh, the market is like, and this is like the same for everyone else, like, you know, and all the industries, like it takes a long time for something to move online. So the share moving online will take a long time. So the, the, the huge bargain potential for seeing people and think about it, like, who, why does people want to like go to the local grocery store and like, have like really heavy bottles of wine uh, thrown at home, like, like when they can have it delivered to the front door. It doesn't make sense. So I think there is like just the, like, and this is what we have seen over COVID there. And, you know, the neighbors are seeing those naked bottles stand in front of the front door for their neighbors. And then like, oh, what is this? Can I also try that one? And so this, uh, there's a lot of possibilities there. Does naked wines use labels of where food comes from? <laughs> no, they don't like. <laughs> um, yeah, no. So we uh, we moved on uh, yeah. to where food comes from. What is interesting about the company and what is doing differently than other companies? 
So what we like with where food comes from is really that they are just running with so many headwinds, like um, oh, sorry, tailwinds, uh, with with them. Where like they're in like you know organic food, they're in traceability, they're in like antibiotics, non-GMO, you know, gluten-free, animal welfare, environmental welfare. Like they they are just into all the super trends, and they are just really supporting all that. Um, so for someone that doesn't know what they're doing, they are really like an independent verifier of, um, of sustainable food. So basically, in in Europe and in there, there is it is mandated for like cows to have those ear tags so that you could trace how their age is and how they are like sourced and what the background is and if they are moved, you can so if they get sick or something, you could trace them back to the farm. Um, that is not mandatory in the U.S., but what has happened over the last few years is that U.S. want to export a lot of their beef to China and Europe, and they demand those traceability. So what Naked Wines does is they both sell the ear tax, but they do the on-site uh, farm audits. So basically, they send people uh, to go to the farm and say, oh, and they have different standards. They test, like, do they treat antibiotics in the food? Uh, do they, you know, if they say this um, is gluten-free, is it really that? So I would compare it mostly with like an, you know, an auditor of a financial company. Like we have someone coming out, you know, once a year and checking that the, you know, the numbers are accurate. And this is the thing here, that they are just the, the trusted party uh, that does this. I don't want to talk about your text uh, favorably, but how sticky is the business? So actually, like in they they sell ear tags only for around between six and eight million dollars a year. So six eight million dollars, and they have like eighty percent market share. So that that says a little bit how small the market is. But the good thing is like when the market is so small and they have so big market share, it doesn't make sense for anyone to come in to compete with them because. Why would someone try to like innovate this technology and go out and convince the farm to use their products? And if they can only win like a two million dollar business, so it's really good that it's so sticky and still growing there. Uh, that's the good thing with it. And the logo business they have and uh, the other so, business arms. So um, they they don't really do like logos. That, uh, that that should probably have an explanation. What they do is they have uh, where fruit comes from label. So basically, what the retailers are doing, they can uh, they could put this label on the food and put it into the grocery store, and then all the people would look at you know the the beef there and can see the where food comes from label, and then they would know that this food has been verified. This beef has an like source and age verification. It's not treated with antibiotics and stuff like that. So they try to build like a consumer brand here um, in the U.S. where like we have this in Denmark. It's different. Uh, different brands there that, that like we have something called like Sven America and stuff like that, that we know like if you buy um, cleaning uh, materials that it's not uh, like something allergic in it and stuff like that. Um, so they basically try to build that with food. Uh, but I think the biggest revenue driver for them now is that consumers want sustainable food. So what consumers want, they, when they go to Burger King, they want to have the you know, the beef that's, you know, have good uh, um, source and age verification. You know, when in Walmart, it's during COVID, all the um, the groceries, like organic food and stuff that, that was thrown out of the grocery. They couldn't like get supply enough. So what Emma, sorry, um, Walmart and, you know, Tyson Foods, and some of those really, really big chains, what they are doing now is that they go to the farmer and say like, we have huge demand for organic food. Can you please source some more organic food? But Tyson's Foods or Walmart, they need to know that, you know, when the producer says the food is organic, it is really organic. So they need to come a middleman and they're come where food comes from in. So they need to be the kind of the verifier and uh, put a stamp on it that is also this way. So there is just a lot of, you know, tailwinds there when, you know, when big companies go to their suppliers and see you need to do this and you need to use where food comes from. Then they will do it. <laughs> I want to show uh, the chart um, of the stock price uh, through the last years because 
it somehow went nowhere uh, yeah. in the last years. And so this is the question: yeah, Why you see an, an interesting point to be invested? I would in say currently. Uh, one thing is it was extremely overvalued at some point. Like, can you try to take 10-year charts here? Uh, sure. First, uh, then you can see how much it went up before that. So basically, the stock went from 0 0.3 to yeah, 3. So it, it was up like 10x in two years before that. So the revenue, mo sorry, the EBITDA multiple went from something like, like you know, 8 to 80. Uh, so, of course, the stock was extremely overvalued at that point. Uh, so we only bought it, I think, last year we started buying it. So uh, when, when the valuation has come down a lot over the last few years. Uh, but but now we are at the point where, you know, the valuation is actually quite cheap again. Uh, you know, it's it's not like a single digit price earning. This is like really, really high quality company. But you're only paying, you know, 15 times free cash flow next year or eight times EBITDA for a business that has, you know, compounded revenue and EBITDA at, plus 20% a year for 12 years in a row uh, without any down year. So it's really, really high quality company with so many tailwinds that you buy for what I would say is quite low multiple now. And, you know, this is stock that, you know, if you look at the stock market today, it seems like every stock has just gone to the moon. This, this is a stock that has gone, as you say, really nowhere for last time. So I think that a lot of, it's really underappreciated still. And that's probably because it's traced on the OTC market. So, you know, it's, it's not, it's a little, a little illiquid. There's a big spread in the stock, and yeah, the how CEO owns uh, thirty percent of it. So the family there, yeah. How do they grow? So they they grow really by you know adding more farmers and selling more yield tax, the hardware, and then by upselling to existing customers. So if you have some customer that is already like doing um, non-GMO treated, then they can also add like. Uh, you know, um, animal welfare stamp on it or like environmentally friendly grown uh, stamp. So existing farmers add more stamps because the more stamps they have, the, the higher price they could get for the foods and the more channels they can sell it into. Uh, so it's really about you know, adding more farmers and upselling. And then it's, they are building um, software solutions on top. So like they do solutions so that like Walmart, they can track all the um, suppliers into a channel um, and all, all this reporting is still done like manually. So basically the auditor comes out with, you know, 80 page PDF and that he has to fill out uh, on site. So they try to invent a lot of uh, software solutions around this process that can upsell. Can they raise prices? Do they have pricing power? Um, they do raise it a little bit, but uh, they also, you know, they know farmers in the U.S. has not has, um, they don't, you know, most U.S. farmers have not like killed it, they made a lot of money over the last few years. So they have been a little protective, not like squeezing money out of someone that, you know, have not made a lot of money. Uh, so I, I think they have some untapped pricing power, but I think they will wait to use it until, you know, the farmers are making a lot of money again. Interesting. I had a conversation with another investor who was invested in the company a few years ago, um, Travis Widor, and he said oh, the management compensation is, um, is a bit tricky in yeah. this case. How do you see it? Um, so I think the, compensa the cash compensation is quite high uh, for such a small company. Um, the thing is, like, if you compare like, total compensation to other companies, it's actually not that high. But that's because, like in other companies, um, the CEO and other management get a lot of stock options. Um, but here, the management team don't get any options. Um, so they, they only have the, the share price and they get a, a cash and maybe a small bonus. So, yeah, I, I, I would say I think, I think the, the, the compensation is maybe a little high compared to what I think I, I'm, I'm comfortable with, but I, I, I do not think it's like exaggerated or anything like that. And, and one thing is like one of the biggest shareholders uh, is a hedge fund um, called Yorkmont Capital. Uh, they have something called uh, Rain Graham um, that sits on the boardroom and he's in the compensation committee. So it's like, you know, if, if the second largest shareholder is deciding the compensation and he, he runs a hedge fund, he, he is mandated to not pay too much to the CEO. So he probably decide what's fair for the CEO there. Um, so it, it's not it's not like the CEO just takes whatever he wants. It's, it it is uh, there's some third party that have real money on the table that uh, decides it. 
But wouldn't it be and also better? also like the um, the C the two biggest shareholders is the the CEO and his wife that is he the president so they they work together here really yeah. maybe let me add two questions uh, wouldn't it be better if they were paid in stocks because um, the yeah, interest but, uh, is higher to yeah but they still they own so much stock like they own thirty percent of the company and the stock is not that um, you know. Uh, liquid. So, like, if, if they were only paid really low in cash, they would have to constantly, and they don't pay dividends because they grow so much. So then they will, ha they have to sell stock on their market to finance you know, the personal uh, spending. So I will also say it would be quite bad if they kept selling stock in the market to finance that. Then I would, I would rather have they don't sell in stock as they hadn't done, but then get a little more cash so that they can not, not sell stock. Yeah. And how do you see the quality of management? And owners in this case? Um, I will say the one word I would put on John uh, the, is passionate. Like he, he re, you know, he founded this company from the ground up while his wife Leanne was, you know, she, she was working in the industry, tried to, to like, she made an income for the first three years so they could support the family while, while the company was making nothing. Uh, and then John just ramped this thing up from the ground up. Um, and when Leanne joined the company, she already had a lot of connections in the industry that she could use to kind of push the, uh, the it in even more. So it is really like family driven. It's really what I would call like purpose driven. It's a management team that understands that, you know, they should build a much, much bigger company in, in the end. Um, and they have been quite good at capital allocation. Like the acquisitions they have done has turned out quite well, I would say. Uh, then it's Biguna, like bundling and investing in different stuff. Uh, but they, they do like something also. I think there is, it is not run that efficient, the company. I think there is some cost that could be taken out. And I think they could do a little more like communication. And, and they, have, they have some like internal control issue a few years back. And so there's some place to improvement. But I would say the thing we like is, is you know, They, they work a lot of hours to create like a much bigger company and they burn for it. So, yeah. Where do you see the company in five to 10 years? So the one thing I would say is like much larger than today. Um, and one thing like uh, people think here is just also like, this is like a small listed company. They have like huge margin potential. As you said, like the, there is like somehow high compensation to the management and to like office buildings and stuff like that, that they need to keep. And also just like the auditor stuff like that, when you're such a small company, that's a big expense. But when you grow the revenue and the margins there, so that there would be a lot higher scalability when they keep growing there. So I think the margins will expand a lot. Um, and then, you know, they just have a lot of tailwinds there. So, you know, as long as consumers want to have more organic food and environmentally you know, grown food, that they will keep benefiting. Thank you very much on where food comes from. I want to make a call to the audience. If there are more questions, please type them in now that I can ask them as well. There's one question on position sizing and selling and buying. Um, how do you think about sizing and eventually trimming or selling your positions? Um, so I would say about we normally try to build positions a little slower. So, you know, when, when you start buying, we normally not, we normally don't go for zero to 15 or something. It, it will be more gradual, like as, as we get more comfortable with the story and as we see events play out, we want to increase it more. Uh, so we're not, we're not afraid of buying higher and higher and higher in a stock as long as they keep like doing well. So like it can be stock has been up a lot over the last, uh, you know, year or so, but we actually kept buying on the whole way up as events played out. And um, and uh, we will, you know, decrease the company if it gets too too big in the portfolio. So we have so like really small positions in company just to make the size, uh, you know, inside what what we think is we are comfortable with. But it's still a large position today, even through it's, it's up this much. Um, so I think in the past, what I did too much was I sold the winners too early, and then I kept on to the losers. And that is something I really learned from now that. I think I've become much better at cutting the losers early and then the winners compound and grow. Uh, so I think that's quite a valuable point to, to make. 
What are some red flags that will make you avoid a stock completely? Uh, something is just if, if it's outside my comfort zone. So if they do something I don't understand, like, you know, there could be industries that I don't understand. Um, but then it's also like uh, if there's a lot of like external factors, like if, if some company is like depending on only one customer or like if, if some company is, uh, you know, have a lot of like commodity risk or interest rate risk or currency risk or something that can come from the outside and, and crunch the company. Um, that is something, you know, I worry about a lot. Um, and then, of course, like it, it's, I, I try to spot red flags in the, you know, the customer proposition. But what, one thing I, I did in the past, but what, I, what I've tried to not do anymore is like, I really look at, you know, does this product make sense to the consumer? And does it actually create value to the consumer? And if there's, and you know, if the management is credible and the business makes sense, so then I think it's a, it's a go. I want to raise the last question that's highly awaited. But before yeah. that, I would ask the audience to leave a like. If you like the content, this supports my work. and helps me to get more viewers, which is also important here. I can definitely support that. <laughs> Thank you. It's, the question is, if there's, if you currently find a very interesting stock that's too small um, or too illiquid for your fund. Uh, not something I hadn't, board i think um i i can mention one stock that i actually own that i can't buy more of because it's too small um it's it's a uk company called get busy uh, so we own around three percent of the company already just below three and we can't really buy more because then we have to flag it to the authorities and stuff like that so uh, so it, it's sized uh, as big as we can do uh, so i can mention it here um but that that's a really nice company it's like you know recurring revenue software growing at you know 25 percent a year we're trading at like two times rr on the aim in in london that i think is really really interesting company i think people should look at as you mentioned this another question for me came up how many positions do you hold and what is the rough split on sectors you're invested in um when I normally help between 12 and 18 companies, I would say. Um, now, I, now I got my first employee uh, a few months ago, so I think we could go a little higher in position size now that we are two people. Um, but th that's my comfort zone that, you know, I, I would say around 20 is probably my comfort zone there, I think. I, I, but the sum is like really small companies. So, you know, the biggest companies is like between 14 and 18% of the fund. So we are quite concentrated in the best ideas there. Uh, and that, what was the second question? What are the sectors you're invested in? Ah. Um, so we, we really do everything. So I would say we, we don't do, you know, bombs and pistols and, you know, so, something like, uh, I'm not too much into this ESG what every people talk about but i would say like there is like some sectors i don't want to touch there but mostly i try to avoid stuff that i can't understand like biotech or like even some shipping and oil and stuff i, I think it's too volatile i don't understand it and so i try to avoid that um but you know then everything is like really a go for me but i would say like uh, software is something i do a lot in um I do a lot of like what I would call B2B suppliers to, to other companies that I can like track, where I can track like unit economics, understand the customer proposition and stuff like that, I think is really interesting. Then uh, for the end of our interview, you have the chance to add something we haven't discussed. Mm, I can't really think of anything, you know. I, I, I write the newsletters on my website. I think people should, should read them. There's, you know, interesting stuff there. And I think I, I try to I try to really like put out what I think is is interesting topics uh, when I write them and uh, yeah. Then I want to say thank you to you and as well to the audience for the good questions. Thank you very much for joining us tonight. I want to ask you to stay on for a second yep. and, and thank you for having time me. Time to say bye to the audience. Uh, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you for listening. Bye bye.
Yep, we are offline now.